What is load factor and why do pilots care about it? What does it mean when a fighter pilot says that they're pulling G's and how could too many G's break the wings off of my airplane? Those answers coming up. Welcome to Free Pilot Training, I'm Josh and today we're talking about load factor. Load factor is an important topic because it provides two distinct ways for pilots to kill themselves. And I'll explain all that. But first, let's talk about a couple things you need to know about. When an airplane is in straight and level flight, the lift that the wings produce goes straight up. And once again, we call this vertical lift. Now, to keep ourselves from descending during straight and level flight, our wings only need to produce enough lift to offset the weight of our aircraft. That's why I've been emphasizing that in straight and level flight, lift and weight are equal. But what happens when we turn the airplane by rolling it one way or the other? Well, first, this causes some of that lift to be pointed sideways instead of straight up. You could say that some of this lift is now moving horizontally, and it's that horizontal component of lift that causes our airplane to turn. But when we roll to the side and we convert some of that vertical lift to horizontal lift, vertical lift is decreased. This means that if we don't do something, the airplane will descend because vertical lift and weight are no longer equal. So, to keep yourself from descending, you need to increase the lift that your wings are producing. And how do you think we can do that? Yeah, we simply pull back on the yoke and increase our angle of attack. And this is what turns our airplane. It also keeps us from descending, but when we do this, something really interesting happens. How many of you guys remember Newton's first law of motion from your high school science class? If you don't, it basically states that an object in motion will continue that motion until acted on by an outside force. In other words, a moving object is going to have a tendency to resist changes in its state of motion. This means that when you roll an airplane to turn and you convert your vertical lift to horizontal lift, the airplane is going to resist that movement. Now, I'll draw this out as an arrow moving in the opposite direction of our horizontal lift, but in reality, this is just inertia resisting our change in motion. And inertia directly opposes the movement of our aircraft. So now you can see that there are two things that we have to account for if we want to be able to properly turn the airplane. We have to overcome inertia to actually turn the airplane. And then we have to account for reduced vertical lift because if we don't, the weight of the airplane will cause the airplane to descend. So weight and inertia are two forces that combine into a resultant force that must be overcome in order to properly turn the airplane. And this resultant force is what we call a load or the load factor. Keep in mind, we also have a resultant force up here as well. When we combine our vertical lift and our horizontal lift, we get what we call total lift. And ideally, the load should directly oppose our total lift. Otherwise, the load could put too much stress on one of the wings. So the load factor is a combination of our weight and the inertial force that tries to keep our airplane from turning. And now that you understand what the load is, we can talk about some other stuff. First of all, what part of the airplane is responsible for holding up the weight of the aircraft? Yeah, the wings are, aren't they? And when we roll into a bank, airplane manufacturers have to account for that load factor that we place on the wings because if they didn't, the wings could literally break off anytime you tried to roll the airplane. And that's an airplane I'm not interested in flying. But here's the thing, the load on your airplane can increase for quite a few different reasons. And you need to know what causes that load to increase so you don't accidentally break off the wings. Yes, people have actually broken their wings off because they didn't understand this. Now you already know that when we roll the airplane, our load increases when we try to maintain level flight. But the more you roll the airplane, the harder it is to maintain level flight because horizontal lift increases while vertical lift decreases. In fact, if you want to maintain level flight, the load factor has to increase exponentially with bank angle. Take a look at this chart. I want you to notice that the more we increase our bank angle, the bigger load we need to keep us from descending. And at a 90 degree angle of bank, you cannot maintain level flight. This is something you need to keep in mind because if you bank the airplane too much and you're trying to maintain a specific altitude, you can put extreme loads on the airplane. Another thing that can increase our load factor is airspeed. This is, once again, because of Newton's first law. The faster I'm traveling, the more my airplane wants to continue moving straight ahead. And when I bank the airplane, that inertial force is really, really strong. So if I'm super fast and I roll into a bank, this can also put a significant load on the wings. 
Now, I do want to mention that you don't necessarily have to be in a turn to increase the load on the wings. Let's say I'm in a descent headed towards the ground. What do you think will happen if I level out really fast or I pitched up really aggressively? Yeah, inertia is going to cause that weight to put a bigger load on the wings, won't it? And once again, the faster we're flying, the bigger the load factor because the airplane wanted to continue along its original flight path. Once again, the wings on our airplane can only carry so much. And anytime we increase the load factor, this puts more of a strain on the wings. And because of this, we need a way to measure the load that's put on our aircraft. This is actually really simple. In fact, we do this by using gravity as a unit of measurement. This measurement is what we call G-forces or Gs. Let's say I weigh 200 pounds. If I'm standing on the ground, I'm pulling one G because the force of gravity is the only thing keeping me in place. But if I jumped up and I smacked the ground, my load factor increases for a split second. In fact, if I could jump high enough and I caused myself to weigh 400 pounds when I hit the ground, I would be pulling two Gs because that's twice the pull of gravity. If I could jump high enough to impact the ground with 600 pounds of force, then I would be pulling three Gs because my load is three times the force of gravity. So you can see that if I start pulling four Gs in my Cessna 172 that weighs 2,300 pounds, this could really put a strain on the wings because that would be the same as my airplane weighing 9,200 pounds. That seems really dangerous, doesn't it? Yeah, it's extremely dangerous. This is why aircraft manufacturers will tell you the load limitations for your aircraft in the pilot's operating handbook. And sometimes they'll even put them on a placard in the airplane so you know for sure that you're safe. Take a look at the POH for this Cessna 172 Sierra. And I want you to notice that we've actually got a few different G limitations in here. First of all, we've got two categories in this plane. We've got a normal and a utility category. I'll go into more detail about these in a future lesson, but these categories mostly depend on the weight of your airplane. Let me ask you a question. Let's say my mom weighs 160 pounds and she jumps up and smacks the concrete at two Gs. Would she cause more or less damage than your mom if your mom weighs 500 pounds and does the same thing? Well, at two Gs, your mom is creating a thousand pounds worth of force, so just about anything under her is toast at that point, isn't it? That's why a lighter aircraft can often take on more Gs and your airplane is much lighter in this utility category. But I want you to notice a couple more things. First of all, notice that your wings can typically take a higher load when the flaps are retracted. This is because flaps actually increase the structural integrity of the wings when they're up. Then I want you to notice that we have a negative G limitation in addition to the positive G limitation. Have you ever been on a roller coaster? If so, then you probably felt all the blood rush to your head as you started the descent from that super high spot. This is basically what a negative G is. Your weight is actually producing an upward force instead of a downward force. And I don't want to spend a bunch of time on this, but I want you to notice that airplanes are typically not designed to take a bunch of negative Gs. This Cessna 172 Sierra can only take negative 1.52 Gs. So don't be forcing the nose down when you're pitched way up unless you're flying super slow or you're trying to break a stall. In fact, this is actually why you're supposed to pitch down before you roll wings level during the unusual attitude maneuver. We want to avoid negative Gs as much as possible. Now, I do want to mention that you probably won't break the wings off of your airplane if you hit your G limitation. You should never try to fly an airplane close to its G limits but you also don't need to be worried about breaking your wings off. In reality, if you were to hit the maximum load of your airplane, you would definitely damage the structural integrity of the wing and you would possibly bend the metal, but it actually takes quite a bit to break the wings off. But I want you to consider something. First of all, how old is the airplane you're flying? Metal gets weaker with time. Second, who else has flown this airplane? If it's been flown by everyone and their dog, have they damaged the wings by flying too close to the G limitations? What happens when you bend a paperclip one time? It just bends, doesn't it? But if I bend it back and forth, it's gonna get brittle, won't it? Consider that when you're flying. This is actually what I think happened to that guy at that gender reveal. I doubt this is the first time he explored the G limitations of his airplane. He probably bent that wing back and forth and back and forth until the wing structure was weakened. And then bam, not a good day. Okay, so that's the first way that load factor can allow a pilot to kill himself. In just a minute, we'll look at another way that you could kill yourself by accident. 
But before we do that, I want to ask you a question. Are you studying for the private pilot or the sport pilot written exam? If so, have you been endorsed to take the written exam yet? If not, you actually need an endorsement to take either one of these tests. And I offer the premium version of these courses for only $50. And both of those will issue an endorsement when you finish them. These courses take these videos and they include over 700 questions worth of quizzes and practice tests to make sure you're ready for the FAA written exam. In addition to reading assignments that can be super helpful in solidifying these concepts. And your purchase makes it possible for me to make these videos. So please check out freepilottraining.net if that interests you. Sorry about that. My marketing manager made me put that in this video. Anyway, let's talk about another way you could accidentally kill yourself if you don't have a good understanding of load factor. Anytime we increase the load factor on our airplane, stall speed will also increase. But don't forget, our airplane always stalls when the wings exceed their critical angle of attack but the speed at which that happens can change. And this is important to remember because if you stall the airplane at a higher airspeed, you're probably not gonna be expecting it. And this can be extremely deadly. This is what we call an accelerated stall. Take a look at this chart from the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge. Here on the left, we have load factor, and then on the bottom, we have speed. And the first thing I want you to notice on this chart is your normal stall speed. And I'm showing you this because I want you to see that up to this point, the airplane will stall no matter what the load factor is. But notice this curved line above our normal stall speed. As you can see, as load factor increases, so does stall speed, just like we mentioned. And actually, this is something I wanna show you really quick. Stall speed actually increases by the square root of your load factor. Keep in mind, you won't need this for the written exam, but this is something that you should really know how to do. Take a look at this chart. As you can see, in order to maintain level flight during a 45 degree bank turn, we have to pull 1.414 Gs to keep us from descending. And because of this, I can actually calculate the stall speed of my airplane in a turn so I know a safe airspeed to fly so I don't kill myself when I bank the airplane up to 60 degrees. And I don't mean to sound crass when I say this, but extreme bank angles have killed many pilots for this very reason. So it's important for you to know about this. Now, I'm not trying to scare you by showing you this clip. I just want you to realize that bank angle can significantly increase the stall speed of your aircraft. So let's look at how much bank angle can actually affect it. Let's say the stall speed of my airplane is 50 knots. Once again, stall speed increases by the square root of the load factor. So if I take the square root of 1.414 Gs, this means that my stall speed will increase by almost 20%. This means that my new stall speed will be almost 60 knots. And once again, if you're not expecting this, it could be disastrous. But let's take a look back at our chart. I want you to see something here. Once again, load factor increases with stall speed. But for every airplane, there's a magical little airspeed that every pilot should know about. This is called maneuvering speed, or VA. Up to this airspeed, the airplane will stall before you could ever possibly over-G or overload the airplane. If you fly above this speed, you would bend or damage the airplane before you could ever possibly stall. Keep in mind, there are different reasons why you might want to fly above or below this airspeed, but it's important to know what that airspeed is in your airplane because this helps you to make good decisions. Take a look at the POH in this Cessna 172 Sierra. The first thing you'll notice is that you typically have more than one maneuvering speed. And that's because this speed is based on your weight. Do I need to remind you about your mom? Okay, I won't. But let's say that my airplane weighs 2,200 pounds. And if I'm flying at an indicated airspeed of 95 knots, you can see that VA in this case is 98. So what should I be more concerned about if I'm flying at 95 knots, stalling the airplane or damaging the airplane? Yeah, below 98, I'm gonna stall first, won't I? What if I'm flying 105 knots? Yeah, in this case, I'm more concerned about bending my wings, aren't I? And this is another reason why airspeed is so important. In fact, it's so important that the airspeed indicator is required any time you go fly. And we'll be talking about this more in an upcoming video. I hope you enjoyed today's video on load factor. In the next video, we're going to be talking about how to calculate load factor. So stick around for that video. And by the way, I want to thank everyone who's watching this video through one of my premium ground courses. If you purchased the $50 course and you're enjoying it, please comment below and let everyone know that it was worth the 50 bucks for this ground course. A lot of people are hesitant to buy it because it's so cheap. 
But if you guys could do that for me, it would mean a lot. That way they can see how great of a deal it actually is. Thanks for doing that, and thanks for watching. We'll see ya.